if you don't have the foggiest idea where to start in seeking to study properly for the IELTS test, for the IELTS speaking part of the test, then this video is for you. Hey, hello again, and welcome to another video. Today, we are going to talk about something very special. We are going to talk about how not to study for the IELTS test, because many people want to know how they should start, how they should study, what they should do, but it's quite unusual that you think, why should I not do when studying and when preparing for the IELTS test? And that's what we are going to tell you. That's what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk to you about eight ways of how not to study for the IELTS test. I have written an article and I'll read it through with you, right? And discuss some things that are quite relevant and crucial for all development in seeking to master the speaking part of the IELTS test. Right, studying for the IELTS test is hard, I know, but there are some attitudes that must be uprooted from you and cast away if you want to succeed. Right, that attitudes, that behavior, they are oftentimes treacherous for your learning. Right, if something is treacherous, that means that it represents a menace, it represents a danger to your development, right? In this class, as I said, I will teach you eight things to not do when preparing for the IELTS test, mostly for the speaking part of the IELTS test, right? Then you will be able to accurately study and prepare yourself for your test and get higher marks, okay? Uh, I have prepared this list so you can see what common mistakes people out there make, okay? If you don't have the foggiest idea where to start in seeking to study properly for the IELTS test, for the IELTS speaking part of the test, then this video is for you. Let's get to it. Number one, being afraid of mistakes. This is probably one of the biggest obstacles in your development. And this is also a bad way to study for the IELTS test, being that afraid of mistakes. Fear can grow and can be outspread throughout your whole body, limiting your actions and undermining your plan, right? I'm sure, I am sure some people even feel petrified Right? Like they were inside a horror story, right? On the verge of suffering a nervous attack when they get on the sport, right? So there is a quote, right? I like to use in this content. One of my favorite British writers is Adam Neville. And in one of his books, there was a character who was facing a scary situation, right? as you might be using as a metaphor for your test, right? Being there in front of an examiner, right? And he, the, the writer, described, the way he described the feeling of the character was like this. He tried to thaw his mind from shock. He tried to thaw his mind from shock. If you thaw something, you get something that is frozen, and start to heat it until it's at normal temperature, right? So you see, when that, it is as if their mind was frozen, right? So that's the feeling of being at that situation, right? By the way, I was reading um, an Stephen King book once, and I came across this expression: a pregnant silence. A pregnant silence. That would be that moment, that precise moment when everything is pure silence, waiting for something to happen, 
Don't you feel like that when your examiner asks you a question and you don't know what that question will be or that moment before he asks you the question, you're like, what this is going to be like? I don't know. That would be a pregnant silence, right? And paraphrasing King here, I can definitely see the fear of committing mistakes as a pregnant fear, right? And you feed it. You feed this fear expecting something bad to happen if you say a mistake, right? That's what we do. We naturally feed that waiting for something bad to happen, right? But let me ask you something. Do you make mistakes in your mother tongue, in your native language? Well, I'm guessing you do. I guess you do because everyone does, right? We are all human beings, right? And when you make mistakes in your native language, what do you do? I'm assuming you just correct yourself, right? So let me tell you, if you commit mistakes in your native language, why wouldn't you also make them in your second language, in your third language, in your fourth language? Committing mistakes is normal. It's healthy during the learning process, right? Try to see the mistake as an opportunity to learn. Let's try to see it like this. And I mean it. When I'm learning a new language, I can say that I'm almost eager to make a mistake because then I will strongly learn something and sometimes even quicker, right? If you want to say something, for example, but you're not going to say because you are afraid of committing mistakes, right? So you will never know if you were right or if you were wrong. So on the other hand, if you just say it anyway, then if you were right, good for you, well done. If you were wrong, then you're going to learn. And that's the beauty of it, right? Moreover, if you're practicing your speaking skill with a teacher or a tutor, that is the best time for you to get help because you really don't want to make those mistakes there in front of your examiner, right? Doing your exam. But you surely can make them in your practicing time with your teacher, right? That's your time to try. That's your time to try doing something new right? Using expressions that you might not be sure of, right? That you might remotely be aware of. If you're thinking, mm, should I use that? Should I try? Go on, go for it, right? Besides, all we all need to stop trying to be perfect, right? Because we simply can't. There is no such thing as perfection. Perfection is an idea, to make, us, to make us all move further, right? Seeking to be better human beings. Only we forget this and think perfection can be reached, can be achieved, but it can't, it can't, right? Let me explain this by telling you a short story, right? Using just a bit from the film V for Vendetta. I don't know if you have seen that one, if you have watched that one, but if you haven't, this is my recommendation for you, right? I'm not telling you the whole story so you don't spoil it for you, but I will tell you this. In the final part of the film, there is a dialogue and there is a conversation and we come across this line. Why don't you die? And then the other character says, beneath this mask, there is a more than flesh. Beneath this mask, there is an idea, Mr. Greedy, and ideas are bulletproof. This is such a quote. This is such a line. I repeat that for you. Why don't you die? Beneath this mask, there is more than flesh. Beneath this mask, there is an idea, Mr. Greedy, and ideas are bulletproof. So, as the character's idea, so he represented an idea, right? I'm not going to tell you which one because I don't want to give you spoilers, but uh, as the character's idea, so is perfection itself. It can't be touched, 
right only sought only desired and inspiring okay so put your mind at rest and worry nothing about making mistakes right second thing second point well this is focusing on one skill and neglecting the others if you are preparing for such an important test as the IELTS you should definitely give attention to every single skill the four assessed skills listening reading writing and speaking are interconnected right and one interferes with the other okay so it's not preposterous so preposterous is absurd right it's not preposterous to say that you will not have impressive skills impressive speaking skills if you don't study the others or that you, you will not have good scores in the listening test if you don't practice your reading to make your vocabulary improved it's not preposterous it's not an absurd to say that right so give proper attention to all the four skills make a routine in which you can plan and execute a strategy to improve your skills of course you will have one that you're bad at right you will have one that is your forte but do not neglect the others because of that right that is quite common um, some students are very good uh, better in one skill and then they focus on that and neglect the others they should rather do the opposite they should focus on the ones they are worse at right because that was the one they are already good right of course you need to keep it at that level but you need to work at the others a routine is a good plan for you a routine is a good plan to follow you need you don't need actually to come up with super complex and extravagant plans to follow what you need is to keep your routine simple and keep going with it focus on what is effective right fail to prepare and then prepare to fail neglect one of the skills and the price would be charged in time meaning eventually eventually the time will be charged okay eventually the price will be charged right number three is spending too much time studying okay so as counterintuitive as it can seem this is a wrong thing to do in most cases yes that's true spending too much time studying is a wrong thing if you have been preparing for the test for a fair amount of time there's no need to think you will find out that golden tip or that precious tip just before your test that's true what you could possibly study you have already studied what you couldn't well you couldn't simple as that right if you have seen the video i recorded with adriel Adriel Kiradium, she's a quantum therapist, and there we discussed a bit about this the moments before your test, right? And how to deal with stress and anxiety. But what I want to mention here is that we talked about that at that moment, those moments, those hours before your test, it's not the time for you to do this, right? What you could have learned, you have learned. What you couldn't, you couldn't right take the last day or the last couple of days before your test to rest your mind you have done the work right as as athletes need rest days before competition because they have trained already your mind also needs some rest before your test that's it rest is necessary so that your brain can repair rebuild and strengthen its abilities think about this it makes sense right i know it does because that's what happens you if you have been preparing very nicely properly doing what you need to do then that's the time for you to rest let your body let your brain let your mind do the work now
right? And this is also true for when your test is not closed yet. This is not. This is also true for when your test is not closed yet. Of course, when you have time, you don't need days of rest, right? Because you are inside a routine, and that's important, right? A plan that you're following. But that doesn't mean you don't need to rest. Our brains are formidable tissue-made machines and can do incredible things. They need some time to rest, though, right? There are some scientific works telling us that when we are studying, our brains can only remain focused on the task for up to 45 to 60 minutes, right? After that, they start to lose focus and therefore there can be some attention loss, right? And that's not good for you. That's one other reason for you to not study too much, right? And that's a natural process because our brains never stop working. And then they need to find a way to relieve and not become overwhelmed with information. If you are overwhelmed, you are receiving more information than you were expecting and you might be a bit um, feeling under pressure with that, right? So overwhelmed, an extreme load of something on you, okay? Because of that, try to give yourself some minutes while you're studying. It can be a five to ten minute break, right? But do it you will see how relevant this is and how further on you can go like that. You'll see, okay? Number four, not practicing what you have learned. This is another way of how not to study for the IELTS. I know it, it looks like counterintuitive too, but that's it. Not practicing what you've learned, it's also a bad thing here. It's also a problem, right? You know what they say, right? No plan survives the battlefield. No matter how many times I say to my students if something is just theory, people will not pay attention until they are on the battlefield, until they put it in practice, right? But this is due to our instinct of learning better when we are doing something, right? That's the reason you should go to the battlefield. You need you should practice the things you study in theory, right? You need to put them in practice. It's, it's like they say, better done than perfect. I like this quote. It's a quote from a um, Canadian uh, dog trainer called Susan Garrett. She said that once and it's fantastic. Better done than perfect. Do not wait for perfection. Do not wait to do something until you are perfect, right? Go, do it, and then, if needed, you can work on the fine adjustments and we'll already have an idea of what's working and what's not, right? Just do it, go, right? Put that in practice, okay? Don't wait for you to be, oh, I want my grammar to be perfect, then I will practice, then I will talk to someone, then I will talk to a teacher. Just go, just do it, right? Don't wait for perfection because, remember, perfection cannot be achieved. When we are waiting for something to be perfect, first we tend to procrastinate to postpone the action, the decision to be made, right? Oh, my vocabulary is also not good enough. So someone could say, right, as a reason to not have classes or to not take the test. But let me say something to you. That is not a reason. That is an excuse. A reason is a fact that explains why something happens, why an excuse is a justification for what happens. I'll repeat that for you. A reason is a fact that explains why something happens, while an excuse is a justification for what happens. So do not justify something that's not a reason. 
or in other words, make your excuses to be the best reason for you to do something, right? If you reckon your vocabulary is not as good as you wish, then make it happen. Do something. But know that that's not a reason, right? So don't wait for it to be perfect, right? If you have learned a few good words, use them. Put them in practice, right? Don't wait for it. Don't wait for your vocabulary to be perfect, though. You have, if you have learned a few good words, use them. Put them in practice instead of waiting to learn more until it's perfect. And I say perfect between quotes because perfection doesn't really exist, does it? Right? And for example, I think some full videos before I talked about five advanced words to using out. Just five. Not 20, not 50, not 100. Learn five. Then put them in practice. Then you learn another five ones. Put them in practice. Then you learn another five ones. You see? It's, that's a plan. It's a strategy, right? It's a long-term thing. So we'll never be perfect. So accept it. Put in practice the things you have studied or learned. For this is more important and more effective, actually, than trying to reach an idea that doesn't even exist in the real world, right? Let's talk about the next one, the number five. Another way of how not to study for the IELTS test, for the speaking part of the test. Thinking you don't need preparation. Have you ever tried to do something that you simply don't know how to do? Like losing weight? Have you tried to lose weight without knowing how? We try one diet, start exercising, prepare some recipes, and don't get the expected results. Have you passed through a situation like this? Then we go to another diet, try to cut this and that off our meals, and still we achieve nothing. And this scenario keeps going until we find help with someone who does know how to do it. It usually is still difficult, but now results are achievable, feasible, simply because someone else knows the relevant information we need knows how to teach us how to do it, the way to do it, right? And I won't lie, even when we know how to do it, it's still difficult, but we can see the results. Now imagine, if even when we know how to do it, it's still hard, now imagine without knowing, that's the thing. And when it comes to studying for the IELTS test, it's the same. It's just exactly the same. Even when you know how to do, you know what and how to do, it is still hard, let alone when you don't, right? That's why not to prepare is a wrong approach. I'm not saying you must have classes with a teacher, although this is immensely helpful, but you must prepare yourself, that's for sure. Even if it is just looking for information on the internet, just, you need something, right? You need a light. You need something to enlighten your mind. You can study and prepare by yourself, but trust me, it's going to be more arduous and take longer than it could be if you had looked for help with a teacher or if you had taken a course. That is for sure, right? You would probably take more time to achieve your goals and would also be likely to spend more money with the test attempts. That's the truth, right? Okay, you can prepare yourself by yourself, but how long does it take? How long is it going to take? How long will you be studying and suffering, struggling with the things you don't know how to do or you think you do, but you don't? How long, right? How many attempts to the test you're going to take? That's the thing, you need, remember the plan? You need to think forward. You need to think ahead, right? Let's just think together. 
is you have never taken the IELTS test before. How could you, by yourself and without preparing, connect all the dots and know the things you need? Now, if you have taken IELTS before and failed, well, then you already know that you should have looked for help, preferably with someone who knows the ins and outs of the test, the details of it, right? That's the thing. It's simply easier to get help from those who have already passed through it and know the struggles, the difficulties, the tricky parts and the best course of action for you to take. So help yourself and do not skip this step. Preparation. Right? It will save your time, it will save your money and peace of mind. That's the thing. Right? You will have peace of mind. Okay? Let's go see number six. Another way of how not to study for the IELTS test. Being nervous. Being nervous. Some students get nervous even before taking the test, when they are still preparing. They can get overwhelmed by many different factors, such as self-created expectations, demanding too much from themselves, fear of failure, little time to study, anxiety when thinking about the test. First of all, it is okay to feel like that, right? It is okay not to be okay. That, that's the, the, the best time to use that quote. It is okay not be okay, right? You don't need to deny it, okay? Because preparing for IELTS is something that can't be compared to a school exam, for example. It can't be compared, right? There, there is too much involved, right? There are many, there are way more things involved in it. Generally, people taking the IELTS test are immigrating from their countries or to another one. And not rarely with their families. That's the thing. There are definitely many relevant and crucial nuances involved. And those, those nuances, those facts, they add extra, an extra layer of pressure onto a candidate's mind, right? I know, I know. However, I reckon I can tell you a story. A story that might help you. Okay, and this story has allowed me to become better and to understand how I can help people around me. So here's the thing. In my early 20s, I had a girlfriend. She didn't live in the same city, but we managed to maintain the relationship for some time. Maybe this was one of the reasons for my behavior. I don't know. The fact remains that I was jealous. Blimey, how I was jealous. <laughs> One day, after telling her this and admitting it was difficult for me to handle, I asked how she could not be jealous. I was intrigued. How she could not be jealous. And she calmly said to me, I just don't think about things that can make me jealous. Uh, at that time, it sounded counterintuitive for me. I mean, how could I simply ignore something that it was in flames inside me? It was a consuming feeling, right? It turns out that I decided to give it a try. I like reading. I've always liked it. One day, I found a book called Confession of a Child of the Century by Alfred de Musset. In that book, the author discusses the feeling of jealousy, right? And I'm not going to spoil the reading for you, but I will tell you this. The way out the character found was exactly what she had told me on that day. When he ignored the feeling, his life simply started getting better. And by saying ignored. I mean, when he stopped worrying about things he had no control over. 
I'm not saying just for you to ignore in the sense of, oh, I'm pretending not to see. No, that's not the thing. I'm saying stop worrying about things you have no control over, right? When I apprehended that, I sim it simply changed my life. It was mind-blowing for me. Of course, it took me some time to train my brain, but I knew what it could help me. More than knowing, I was determined to do it, right? And that's what we can take out of this short story. We need to stop worrying about things we don't have control over and start focusing on the things we do have, right? Tell me, do you really think you have control over the questions your examiner might ask you? Do you really think so? Uh, you can study all websites you find, all the questions you can find on the internet, but do you really think you have control over that? that you can be sure about corresponding to an expectation. No, you simply don't. What you can control though, are the actions you can take right now. The actions you are doing at this precise moment, listening to me. You are here, you're listening to me, or reading this article, right? If I have posted, you do have, um, taking it for reading and this is something you can control take the information here insert it and use it use it if it's useful for you okay we cannot go back into the past to make things differently right you cannot change your previous says and your previous behavior no as we cannot go further into time and see what would be best for us. We cannot do that either. The only moment we have control over is the present. Most of the time, we keep ourselves like drinking either from the bottle called past, creating anguish, or drinking from the bottle called future, creating anxiety, right? And because of that, we stay for ages inside this quandary, inside this dilemma, right? We should better drink from the bottle called present. For this is when we can actually take control over our actions, right? And over our lives. So if I could say something to you, that would be focus on what you can do right now and try, really try, as a training. Try not to worry about the test, right? I know it's hard, but try. Try applying that information, applying that knowledge, right? That you don't have control over many things, right? Let's go see number seven. Another way of how not to study for the IELTS test. Worrying about your accent. Let me say something right away. You will not be marked on your accent. Let me say it again. You will not be marked on your accent. Having this said, it's additional to know the criteria used for marking you during the test, right? During your test, your examiner will evaluate you considering four criterions, right? They're going to evaluate your level of English, not you actually, your level of English, considering fluency and coherency, lexical resource and accuracy, which is basically your vocabulary, grammar and pronunciation. Those are the things you need to focus on, right? When it comes to accents, people tend to think it's only related to pronunciation. That is a general understanding, for example, that British people pronounce garage when Americans pronounce garage. But the fact remains that is related to a number of pronunciation features, such as rhythm, vocabulary, intonation, pauses, stress, 
as much as it is to pronunciation only, right? Pronunciation is the way we say words and letters or the way we say them properly, right? Now, accent can be seen in general terms as a language pattern, right? A language pattern that is regional or related to regions, okay? You don't need to have British, American, Australian, Scottish, Welsh, or other English accent to pass the IELTS test. Have it in your mind, right? You can have your own. Well, we, we could have another complete video only about what is accent, right? Uh, if there is such thing as British accent, American accent, rather than people's accents, right? But here's the thing, go to the test and be yourself. If you have been exposed to British accent, that's okay. And if you have been exposed to American accent, that's okay too, right? Focus on pronouncing the words correctly. Your pronunciation must be such that it won't interfere with your examiner's understanding of what you're saying. That's the whole point of it, right? One thing you, it's good for you to have in mind, it's not good for you to mix accents, right? It's not good for you to say things in one accent and things in the other accent, mixing them because you would not have consistency. That's one thing. But you can have one accent or another accent, right? Just try to keep like that, okay? Don't worry about should I have this accent or should I have that other one? This worry you don't need to have in your mind, right? Focus on pronouncing the words correctly, okay? Let's go see the number eight, the last way of how not to study for the IELTS test. And that would be comparing yourself to other candidates. Let me tell you another story. When I was a lad, when I was a boy, I used to ask my mom to let me do things I thought were fun, right? With my friends, with kids at school. Nearly every time she would say no. And then I would have the brilliant, the brilliant idea to use this reason. But my friends are doing it. And then she would again show her wisdom, replying, you are not your friends. <laughs> that is to illustrate two things. One, someone else doing something is not a reason for you to do it too. Someone else doing something is not a reason for you to do it too. You have to do something because it's beneficial for you, because it's good for you. And this requires time to be learned, isn't it? Two, that we cannot do what other people are doing. Not the way they are doing, or not with the same ease or difficulty, simply because we are different people. Everyone is different, right? There was once a man, a um, philosopher called Heraclitus, and he said, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and it's not the same man. I'll repeat that for you. No man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. So, we cannot do something that someone else is doing because we are not them, right? They have their own struggles, their own difficulties, their own details in life. We have our struggles, our difficulties, our details in our life, right? We have our personal battle. That's the thing. So there's no reason for you to try doing something 
in someone else's way, okay? After accomplishing something at your own effort, you value your way of doing things, right? So try to develop your own way. I'm not saying you don't need help to learn how to do something better. I'm not saying that to you. I'm just saying that it's not good to, to copy or to imitate other people's attitudes, right? Or better saying, it's not good for you trying to do things exactly the same way they do because you're not them, you are you, okay? You know that person or that friend who passed IELTS and got CLB 10 in the immigration process? Well, we don't know the ordeal. So an ordeal, an ordeal is a very unpleasant and painful experience, right? A difficult experience. We don't know the ordeals, the struggles, difficulties, sufferings, and abdications required. We simply don't know, right? So we really shouldn't compare ourselves with them. We should try our best to accomplish our goals according to our abilities. That's the thing, right? So that would be my advice for you regarding this topic here, right? Try to develop your own way of doing things. And you see, it's actually really, really good. It's great because you feel a more stronger feeling of triumph right? You feel more triumphant in a more strong and pleasant way, okay? Whew, blimey, we made it. We talked about eight ways of how not to study for the IELTS speaking test. I hope you have enjoyed and learned something in the process of listening to me. <laughs> it's time for me to go now, and i see you in the next videos. Cheers!